In 1898, the Canadian sea captain named Joshua Slocum sailed into Newport Harbor, completing a 46,000-mile voyage, the first man ever to sail alone around the world. His voyage has inspired thousands to follow in his wake. Like Magellan and the astronauts, Slocum helped shrink the globe. His book on the voyage is a classic of maritime literature. His complex life swung from poverty to presidents, through mutiny, shipwreck, prison, and even murder. His renown has grown steadily in the 90 years since his death. He is Joshua Slocum, a New World Columbus. Dead for almost a century, Slocum's legacy is vibrantly alive around the world. There have been more replicas of his yawl than of any other boat in history. How many other books written in 1900 are still in print? He has admirers around the globe, historian and writer Myra Lopes. He was, in my opinion, uh, someone who should be put up there with the greatest heroes of the world. Slocum's life is still studied and emulated on training ships like this one, seen here racing from his hailing port of Boston to his birthplace in Nova Scotia. There's a man in England who makes copies of the spray, and, and uh, he estimates that as many as 800 have been made since Slocum's own voyage, which was from 1895 through 1898. So he's had a, a huge influence on people because what he did really changed people's ideas of freedom and of independence. He is honored with plaques from Briar Island to Tasmania. I therefore, William F. Well, Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, do hereby declare April 24th, 1995 as Joshua Slocum Day. Commodore Ted Jones runs the Joshua Slocum Society. He was brave and he was exceptionally smart even though he only had uh, two years of school. So I think what we admire about people like that um, is that uh, they've done it uh, single-handedly. Bars, hotel rooms, and restaurants like this one in Newport Beach, California, are named for the well-traveled mariner. Nova Scotian and New England mantelpieces are rife with models of the plucky little boat, but most of the replicas are full-sized. In Rowley, Massachusetts, a tattooed fiery sea dog named Ken MacArthur worked for years building this spray replica until 1980 when the project was taken over by Fred Ebinger. Uh, I was acquainted with the builder um, when I was kind of a little boy. And uh, when I first saw it, I just thought it was a pirate ship washed up on the beach. Len Pearson, sailing his spray replica, the Thane, in the outer harbor of Victoria, BC, is typical of the many people who have emulated Slocum's life. One day I was just driving along and I found a, a boat under a cherry tree and I recognized it as a spray. So I, I gave the guy my 68 Chevy for the hull and uh, put the decks and cabin on her and uh, built her up and here she is. At the celebration of the 100th anniversary of Slocum's circumnavigation, shipbuilder Ed Davis arrives from Maine with his replica and actor Michael Hogan from Canada in costume as Slocum. With a group of Slocum aficionados, they're sailing across Boston Harbor. Old Joshua left a bit of a legend, and it's that legend of each man in time having the desire, the dream to go to sea. Slocum is more than the inspiration. He's the man who did it. And he's the man by which you compare what you do. David Dunn was an Idaho school teacher who dropped his career for a complex 10-year project on the Ancient Mariner. We are going to recreate Slocum's voyage uh, in its entirety. Uh, again, we'll, we'll enter and exit the ports the same time Slocum did. Our vessel is the largest copy of the spray ever made. We have uh, totally rebuilt her and systems are, are set up uh, as an expedition vessel and then teams of teachers will join me in teams of three. They will teach via satellite into the internet and the lessons will be distributed around the world. 
Who is this man who inspires such enthusiasm? Slocum was born on the edge of the Bay of Fundy in, he writes, a cold spot on coldest North Mountain on a cold February 20th, 1844. His birthplace survives today, as does this school, a memorial to its most famous pupil who attended from 1850 to 52, when his father, unable to make a living from the farm, moved his family of 11 to the rugged southwestern tip of Nova Scotia. Briar Island at the entrance of the Bay of Fundy. Then they would have sailed for the little island. Today, you arrive by a ferry named for the island's most celebrated son. Now it's best known for whales and whale watching. Then the islanders eked a fragile existence from the sea. Most of the buildings were made from timbers of ships wrecked on its beaches and rocks. Slocum was forced into weekly attendance here at the Westport Baptist Church by his tyrannical father, who acted as deacon of the church and held pew 13 for the family. He also pulled Slocum from school to work in this boot shop, turning out leather boots for the island fishermen. So although Joshua would become not only an accomplished sea captain, but also an acclaimed writer, he had left school with only a grade school education. Slocum hated the boot shop, Fascinated by the ships outside the grimy windows, he would retreat into his own world, carving a complex ship model. When his father found what he called the devil's handiwork, he smashed it underfoot, destroying what was left of his relationship with his son. When his mother died a year later, Slocum ran away to sea, first as a cook on a schooner, and then on a deal droger sailing for Liverpool. The wonderful sea charmed me from the first. I was born in the breezes, and I studied the sea as perhaps few have, neglecting all else. The 1860s, the height of the age of sail. As many tall ships were on the North Atlantic then as jetliners are above it today, and the great ports of Liverpool, New York, Halifax, and Quebec were a forest of Nova Scotian spruce. In another 20 years, it would be all over. Unaware that his skills would soon be commercially useless, Joshua Slocum threw himself into learning the ropes and studying the demanding science, just as kids his age do today. The company on today's tall ships may be better than it was in Slocum's day, but the sea is unchanged. The fog is just as thick, the water just as cold, the waves just as big, the masts still as tall. There goes the sun over that way, crossing the horizon at an angle above the horizon. And figuring out where you are using a sextant trigonometry and celestial navigation is still just as complicated. All right, so the book tells us declination, the sextant tells us HO, all we have to do is add or subtract the right way using a formula similar to this, and we've got our latitude, bingo. And that's exactly how Columbus did it too. Slocum became a master navigator, a skill that would serve him not only on the many tall ships he commanded, but even more so on his epic but ridiculously underfinanced voyage alone around the world. My old chronometer, which was a good one, had been long in disuse. I tried to get it cleaned and rated, but they wanted $15 for it. $15. They may as well ask for the moon. I traveled with nothing till I got to Nova Scotia. But once I got to Yarmouth, I got my famous tin clock, the only timepiece I carried on the whole voyage. The price of it was a dollar and a half, but on account of the face being smashed, the merchant let me have it for a dollar. 
So Slocum navigated some of the world's most difficult and treacherous waters using a $1 tin clock. He used the lunar method. Considered laborious and archaic even then, it's forgotten today, but it had the advantage of not requiring absolutely accurate time, thus not requiring the $15 Slocum didn't have. His extraordinary navigation was further tested when a goat, given to him by the islanders of St. Helena, ate his only chart of the Caribbean. So Slocum not only circumnavigated the globe without a chronometer, but sometimes without a chart, relying on his memory of past trips through the Caribbean islands. Slocum's interests were narrow but deep. He was obsessed with the sea, in love with it. Throughout the 1860s and the 1870s, he sailed the Atlantic, the Caribbean, the Pacific, and the South China Sea. He also tried boat building and fishing, and for a season, hunting sea otters off the coast of British Columbia. By 1869, he'd won command of his first ship, a coasting schooner, then moved up to a bark. A year later, he sailed to Australia, where he would meet and marry the second love of his life. At a dance in Sydney, Australia, Slocum met the woman who would become his wife. Her name was Virginia Albertina Walker, and she was very striking, very beautiful. He fell in love with her. And he was only there three weeks, and this just tells you how fast a man he was. He fell in love, he dated her, and he asked her to marry him. And she said yes. He married her January 31st, 1871, and she was very willing to be a sea captain's wife. A year later, um, their first child was born, Victor. Virginia had all her children at sea. It didn't matter where they were in the world. Uh, if there was someone who was available to help Virginia with the birth, that was fine. Uh, they might be in the middle of a stormy sea, but Virginia just seemed to accept those conditions, and that was a way of life for sea captains' wives. In 1881, Slocum won command and part ownership of the Northern Light, at that time considered the finest American vessel afloat. It was the pinnacle of the age of sail and the pinnacle of Joshua Slocum's career. He had financial success, he was well respected, been around the world five times, had been captain of the five of the best ships. And then um, when he had the opportunity to buy the Northern Light, he knew it was his dream come true. He was only 40 years old. But there was a cloud on the horizon, a cloud of smoke from the steamships that were being launched everywhere, taking over and destroying Slocum's world and the age of sail. In the 1880s, they built the Brooklyn Bridge and slung it low enough across the East River that only steamships could get under it, when the world's biggest harbor was suddenly cut off from the sailing ships that had created it. It was a terrible symbol of what was to come. Slocum made a last voyage around the world in the Northern Light, but a mutinous crew made the trip a disaster from start to finish. They came at the captain with knives, whatever they could hold in their hand, and he was fighting someone who had a knife and who was aiming at his throat when Virginia came on deck. The uh, instigator was taken off in handcuffed and taken off to jail. The uh, a mate was killed. In the middle of the Pacific, Slocum came upon five shipwrecked castaways. The ship had a close brush with Krakatoa, the most terrible volcanic explosion in all of history. Off South Africa, it was hit by a storm that destroyed its sails and all its cargo. On the voyage home, Slocum rightly or wrongly imprisoned an ex-convict, now second mate, named Henry Slater. The incident would result in criminal charges against the captain. It would continue to haunt him years later as he sailed alone around the world. Slocum was sailing against the tide. He watched as the masts of his once magnificent vessel were sawn off, the hull turned into a coal barge. It was another terrible symbol of the end of his world. 
Steamships, filthy, stinking steamships, Slocum called them, were taking over. Slocum was loyal to his calling, but thousands left it. It became more and more difficult to get anyone but the worst dregs of society to work the sailing ships. But Slocum soldiered on, downgrading to a smaller ship, the Aquidnik, and began running cargo between North and South America. Again, he took his wife and family traveling with him, but while they were anchored in a steamy cove off Buenos Aires, Virginia died of heart failure on July the 25th, 1884. It was a huge blow to Joshua. And the captain was devastated because this was a marriage of 13 years and he truly loved this woman. Slocum was never the same. In fact, his son Victor said that uh, his father was like a ship with a broken rudder. Slocum returned to sea, returned to America, and 19 months after Virginia's death, entered into an ill-fated marriage of convenience with his Nova Scotia-born cousin, Hetty Elliott. It soon became a marriage of inconvenience. Following Virginia's death, Slocum was visited in quick succession by most of the other horsemen of the apocalypse. Trying to ship a load of poorly packed pianos to Brazil through a winter storm, he lost them and the rest of the cargo, compounding his financial difficulties. As they sailed south to Argentina, the crew became infected with smallpox and cholera. Then after two years of trouble with cargoes, storms, Latin American red tape, and epidemics, Slocum bottomed out with the worst calamity of all for a mariner, shipwreck. I'll wager that since men first took to the oceans, there have been literally millions of ships sunk on the edges or the bottom of the seas. But hefty precedent doesn't make you feel any better when you hear that terrible sound of keel striking bottom or feel the awful sensation as your ship cuts her way, not through water, but into granite. On a sandbar in Brazil, beside the bones and heart of his broken ship, Slocum's career as a merchant captain was ended. From now on, he would be a wanderer. His new mission, his legend, his odyssey had begun. Now, Joshua, by the time he paid the crew off, had lost everything, so he hadn't very much money, hadn't got enough money to get home, and he'd got his wife and two sons with him. And he decided the only real way to get home was to build uh, a seagoing canoe uh, from what he could salvage from the main ship. 120 years later, a Welsh seaman named David Sinnott Jones was in a similar position. His career as a professional racing driver was wrecked when he lost a lung to cancer. His first boat, a replica of Slocum's spray, lay at the bottom of the Irish Sea. Like Slocum on a beach in Brazil, David set about to rebuild his life. I said to Suzanne, that's what I should do. If I can get sponsorship to build a Libertadi, uh, because I'm shipwrecked, so I haven't got a ship, uh, so this is what I should do, the same as Joshua did. He built the Libertadi when he was shipwrecked in southern Brazil. David built a replica, the first ever, of the 36-foot sailing canoe that Slocum had built with his family on the Brazilian beach. The Liberdade voyage, 5,800 miles from Brazil to Washington, D.C., was quite remarkable. Slocum turned the trip into his first book, The Voyage of the Liberdade, and with it began the tradition of Blue Water family cruising adventure that continues to this day. David Sennett Jones's voyage is almost as remarkable. This 71-year-old with one lung sailed his Liberdade alone from Wales to Brazil and then recreated Slocum's route sailing from Paranagua to Martha's Vineyard. Another first for Slocum, once they got to the U.S., was to push their way north through the swamps and wetlands of the Carolinas, 
thus becoming one of the very first blue water boats to navigate what is now called the Intracoastal Waterway. The great Civil War photographer Matthew Brady took this portrait of Slocum. He was earning notoriety, but little else. His new wife, after the terrors of the shipwreck and the dangers of the voyage back, would never sail again. She took the children by rail back to live with her inland relatives. The marriage was beginning to crumble. Within five years, Slocum had lost virtually everything. His wife, his home, his money, his family, and his profession. He had run aground. The world was changing rapidly. Electric trams were replacing horses. Railways were replacing ships. Steam replacing sail. Slocum tried to adjust taking on the dangerous, difficult task of delivering a steam warship, the destroyer, to a dissident Brazilian general. The Brazilians managed to sink the ship. Slocum was never paid, and he returned home bankrupt in pocketbook and spirit. A chance visit to a reading by the great novelist Herman Melville would change his life. At the same time as the age of sail was waning, Melville, along with other writers such as Robert Louis Stevenson, instilled a new spirit of adventure and a dream of islands in the smoky industrial landscape. Wild exclamation of delight, she disengaged from her person the tap of robe which was knotted over her shoulder and spreading it out like a sail, stood erect with arms upraised in the head of the canoe. Slocum was inspired. If there was no more need for sailing captains, then one would just go in smaller boats with family or friends as crew, or indeed sail alone and then, like Melville and Stevenson, turn the adventure into literature and make the voyage pay by telling others about it. So Slocum morphed from successful ship's captain to penniless homeless writer. In the economic gales of the 1890s, with all the old landmarks missing, the boys sunk, the lighthouses out, Slocum was in danger of foundering. In a Boston shipyard, a chance meeting with an old whaler would put his life back on course. Captain Eben Peirce was a whaling captain who had made his fortune and contributed mightily to the decimation of the world's whales by inventing the power harpoon. He listened to the tale of Captain Slocum's declining fortunes. You want a ship, he asked. Come down to Fairhaven. I'll give you a ship. The ship Purse was offering was the Spray, a rotting hundred-year-old oyster smack with a tree growing through it. Slocum found it here, in this field. This is where he rebuilt it, where he launched it, and where he returned three years, two months, and two days later. Ignoring the Yankee naysayers who asked how it would pay to rebuild the old derelict, Slocum set to work. Just as David Dunwood, 120 years later, when he began rebuilding folk singer Burl Ives' spray replica, his first task would have been to build a steam box for the planks for his hull. By the time he had finished, he had replaced virtually every timber in the ancient tub. With each new rib and frame, he rebuilt and reshaped not only the spray, but his own life. It was a, a lot of work and a pretty rough looking project, but the, the, the bare essentials were there in aces and it was very, very good. Len Pearson could be talking of Slocum's work, but in fact, he's talking of his own. So I did a lot of scrounging. Most of the teak came from old steamer doors from an abandoned shipyard. And I chased uh, old uh, demolition uh, companies around to scrounge the best material out of the houses that were being torn down in Victoria back in the 70s. So every piece of wood on this boat is, has a history. Having spent 13 months at exactly $553.62 on the boat, Slocum launched her and sailed to Boston. There he met Mabel Wagnalls, 24, heir to the Funk and Wagnalls publishing empire. She told him to follow his dream to be the first man to sail alone around the world. Everyone else said he was crazy, but she told him the spray will come back. Slocum weighed anchor and set sail, 
on April the 24th, 1895. After lingering in Gloucester, he sailed for his old hometown of Westport, Briar Island, Nova Scotia. What did he find on the island he had left 35 years earlier? A place little changed, and indeed not profoundly changed today, though now full of memorials to its most famed resident. Phil Shea remembers his great aunt's response to Slocum's visit. He had quite a knife for the lady, she said, and my father didn't like it. So when he was here on the spray, he took some, and he asked some of the young ladies in Westport to go out for a sail. And she was very disappointed because her father wouldn't let her. While filming on Briar Island, our crew uncovered a letter by Slocum from Gibraltar, which corrects the story told by all his previous biographers. Slocum did not leave from Yarmouth, as all maps of his voyage would have it, but rather sailed to Halifax, apparently to pick a fight with some unnamed enemy. At the last minute, he changed his mind, sailed around George's Island, and headed back out to sea. Since Slocum virtually invented single-handed sailing, he had to figure out a way to deal with the utter aloneness of it. At first, he tried calling out commands to imaginary mates, but my voice, he said, sounded hollow on the empty air. Soon, the excitement of his adventure overcame the solitude of it. His next landfall was the Azores. Just as the transoceanic wanderers sailing in Slocum's wake do today, he attended shoreside services honoring the local saints and then left his mark on the seawall. He was also given some plums and white cheese that almost killed him. He got sick with food poisoning one time and a big storm coming up and he's lying down below and uh, deathly ill, can't save his life and he looks up on deck and standing at the helms there's, there's a, a man with a black beard and a red bandana who explains he's the pilot of the Pinta, one of Columbus's men, come to help him in his time of need. He says, Skipper, rest easy, I'll take care of your ship for you. So Slocum rolls over and goes to sleep. Next morning he wakes up, sun's shining, storm's gone down, spray is sailing her course, everything's normal. Slocum's apparition continued to help him through difficult moments. But he was not needed on the next stop, Gibraltar, where Slocum was greeted as a celebrity and royally hosted by the British Navy. But they told him that his planned route was far too dangerous. And so convinced that the Mediterranean and Red Seas were infested with pirates, Slocum headed back across the Atlantic, bound for Cape Horn. It would be no good heading for Panama, that project had only begun, transforming the world by digging a canal. Within days, he was attacked by pirates after all, off the Atlantic coast of Morocco. Or so said the newspapers, and so says his book. Were they really pirates? Or were they just dark-skinned sailors traveling the same course he was on, turned into pirates by his imagination? Whatever the truth, he said that just then the wind freshened suddenly, breaking the boom of the Arab Falucca. Slocum kept heading for South America and his greatest adventures yet. The first was a grounding off the coast of Uruguay, which almost resulted in a drowning. Slocum may have been the greatest sea captain of the 19th century. He may have been the greatest sailor of the 20th century, but he did not know how to swim. Few sailors did, especially sailors from those cold Canadian waters. A gaucho tried to make off with both the spray and its tender. Slocum had to fight to get them back. But the greatest adventure and the greatest accomplishment of the voyage was Slocum's passage through the stormy waters of the Straits of Magellan in southern Patagonia. He was not a foolhardy sailor. He was quite conservative. He knew what to do. He knew when to do it. I mean, his remarkable voyage sailing through the Straits of Magellan with all of its adverse winds and storms, and that in itself is a feat that would make a man famous. He was blown out of the Straits, blown back into the Straits, sailed out again. Larry Tyler is a British sailor and filmmaker single-handedly recreating Slocum's passage to the southern tip of South America. Following the wake of Joshua Slocum on the spray, the Dove and I we sailed a similar route from Montevideo to Buenos Aires, and then from Buenos Aires out into the sea, encountering the same kind of conditions that he had, horrible headwinds, and we beat out 
Two days and two nights into nasty, sharp seas. The whole place is like a graveyard to ships. Then once we were out at sea, we headed south down the Patagonian coast, a wild and forbidding country. The winds just howl and howl and howl. Today you could say it's the calm before the storm. It's one of these dead, dead calm days, hardly any wind, we're hardly making any headway. But within an hour we could start having a snowstorm. And in the evening, it could be hailing or heavy, heavy rain. It's a very dramatic and wild corner of the earth. It's a challenge for sailing boats to come down here nowadays. But think of it a hundred years ago when Joshua Slocum was here. It was even more of a challenge. A most remarkable man. On Valentine's Day, 1896, Slocum arrived at the dusty Chilean port of Punta Arenas. There, in a sail loft, he met an old sea captain who suggested a defense technique against the Patagonian natives, then still considered very dangerous, which has become the best known story of Slocum's voyage. Captain Pedro Sandwich gave Joshua a box of tacks. And he told him to sprinkle these on the deck at night so that should any natives try and board him and kill him or take his boat, they would be first stepping on the tacks. And sure enough, these tacks probably saved Joshua's life and allowed him to carry on on his single-handed round-the-world voyage. Although his readers responded with glee to his stories of fending off natives with carpet tacks, in truth, the natives and the wild nature of Patagonia changed Slocum profoundly. It's a fact that in Magellan, I let pass many ducks that would have made a good stew. For in this lonesome, wild strait, I really had no mind to take the life of any living thing. It took Slocum two months to make his way through these convoluted channels, particularly the nightmarish collection of reefs, rocks, and islands called the Milky Way. The Milky Way is considered to be the most treacherous water on the Earth. The story goes is that only two vessels have ever, in that time anyway, have ever made it through the Milky Way. One was the Beagle with Darwin and a full crew, and they made it during the daytime. And Slocum uh, made it through the Milky Way by himself, attacking by sound at night. It, it's just, it boggles my mind to think about it. But uh, I believe five attempts to get it through. I remember one time he, he lost 40 days, he said, and he, he said he just turned the boat around and whistled a new tune and started to attack it all over again. And, uh, uh, you know, that's amazing. You know, those kinds of stories are just great. The three most important voyagers who came down here. The first was Magellan. He discovered the Straits and they have been named after him. And secondly was Sir Francis Drake, who sailed through the Straits from the Atlantic through to the Pacific in 16 days without any charts. And thirdly, and probably the most remarkable in terms of seamanship, would be Joshua Slocum. Then on to Juan Fernandez Island, the home of the original survivor and model for Robinson Crusoe, Alexander Selkirk. He set out across the Pacific. He passed numerous islands, but didn't stop until Samoa, where he was entertained by Fanny Stevenson, the widow of his hero, Robert Louis Stevenson. In Australia, he hauled the boat out for repairs and began to give lectures with magic lantern slides. Mariners like David Sinnott Jones are still continuing the tradition. Here, in the same village hall where Slocum himself had spoken a hundred years earlier. 
From Australia with a new set of sails given to him in Sydney, he sailed to Cocos Keeling Island in the Indian Ocean, a passage of 2,700 miles, in 23 days, of which, Slocum says, he spent less than three hours at the wheel. Many scoffed at this claim, indeed scoffed at his entire voyage. They didn't believe he could sail alone, that the boat would steer itself. Sailing with Sam McKenney off Vancouver aboard his northern spray, talking to him at the bow with no one at the helm, confirms that the spray design is mysteriously able to sail itself. Slocum's voyage took so long that American newspapers began to report that he was lost at sea. Slocum, unaware of these obituaries, blissfully sailed on. In South Africa, the world traveler was invited to debate the shape of the earth with the founder of the Boer Republic, Paul Kruger, who argued that the earth was flat. Slocum took the more conventional position. After Cape Town, it was an easy run up the Atlantic home to America, only 10,000 miles of sailing alone, without a chronometer or engine, and now that the goat had eaten them, without charts. Slocum sailed into Newport Harbor on June the 27th. And then he went on up to uh, uh, Fairhaven for a ceremonial kind of end and then went into Boston on July 4th in 1898. And uh, amazing story, 46,000 miles. The Spanish-American War pushed news of Slocum's feet to the back pages. But with the help of young Mabel Wagnalls, He'd soon change the world's knowledge of his accomplishment by working on his book for the next year and seeing it published in 1900. The reaction was immediately positive. It has been republished many times in many languages. Slocum wrote a classic, and that classic has withstood the years a century now because he says so much about what sailing is all about dedication of a man to his vessel, dedication to learning about the sea, dedication of humility, if nothing else. To be patient and observe is the same way as to be a good writer and to describe something accurately. So I think that comes out, you know, when um, I often hear the, the quote, um, you should uh, write to serve rather than to impress. And he is doing that. He's not looking to impress you with a lot of verbiage and, and flowery language. He's telling the story, which so clearly speaks for itself as such a wonderful feat. But now he was at loose ends. He was 56. He had sailed alone around the world. What could he do to surpass that? In 1901, Joshua Slocum, late of Briar Island, Nova Scotia, was invited to bring his boat to Buffalo, New York, to the great Pan American Exposition, the biggest ever held. He towed the spray by horse up the Erie Canal. The canal, built and expanded throughout the 19th century, played a vital role in opening up the Midwest of America. Now again, Slocum cut a new swath, being one of the very first non-commercial boats to use the canal in the way it's used today, a passage for adventurers between the Great Lakes and the Atlantic and then the South Seas. As can still be seen in this early motion picture tour shot by Thomas Edison, the exposition was a fantastical recreation of Venetian canals and along their sides, electric towers and Eskimo villages and Slocum spray. While Slocum was moored in Buffalo, he printed and sold a small souvenir pamphlet describing his voyage with an autographed piece cut from the tattered mainsail he'd used until Australia. For a Slocum aficionado to find a copy today and touch the sail that took Slocum around the world is a rare and almost awesome moment. Slocum traded yarns here with Buffalo Bill Cody, who'd brought his Wild West show to the exposition. In September, President William McKinley visited the exposition, boarded the spray, and signed Slocum's logbook. An hour later, McKinley was shot to death by an anarchist. Slocum was at the swearing-in of the new president, Theodore Roosevelt, and became a good friend of the energetic and adventurous new chief. 
The exposition is long gone, but this lake and the very wall at Slocum tied to are still there. He left Buffalo for Martha's Vineyard, mooring the spray here in this harbor, just like this replica a hundred years later. Martha's Vineyard is a place of grand yachts, grand hotels, and grand houses. Slocum is still remembered today, though with one of the world's most overgrown and neglected memorials. In Slocum's day, the vineyard was a sleepy farming and fishing community. Slocum tried his hand at growing hops. But it was a dismal attempt to toss in the anchor. It didn't work. Within a year, he was back at sea, sailing for the Bahamas, Jamaica, and the Caymans. But now the spray was beginning to look as weather-beaten as her skipper. In 1908, he told President Roosevelt of his plan to sail to Venezuela, up the Orinoco, and onto the headwaters of the Amazon. He took off into a November gale and was never seen again. He may have foundered in that gale. He may have fallen overboard. Perhaps the old girl sprung a plank. But most likely, one of his hated steamships had finally caught up with him. His most recent biographer, Ann Spencer, has found evidence identifying a particular Caribbean mail steamer as the ship that ran old Slocum down. Whatever really happened, it seems appropriate that the old sea dog who loved the sea and did so much to share that love with the world should still be in and of it. Less appropriate to those who love his memory is the dry language of the Dukes County Court official statement. The court finds that Joshua Slocum disappeared, absconded and absented himself on the 14th day of November AD 1909, disappearing under the following circumstances. He sailed from Tisbury, Massachusetts in the sloop spray of nine tons burden and has never been seen since, and therefore the court declares that the aforementioned be declared lost at sea and legally dead. Joshua Slocum died as he lived, left behind a great legacy, turned his life into literature. Even though his last trip failed, it did inspire the American president to try one of his own. While his family and ancestors are buried in a forgotten family plot in a weed-covered corner of their Nova Scotia farm, the legacy of Joshua Slocum now seems almost carved into the sea itself remembered by all who still go down to the sea under sail. To face the elements is to be sure no light matter when the sea is in its grandest mood. You must then know the sea and know that you know it and remember that it was meant to be sailed upon. You're the singer, 